Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about Bruckner's Sixth Symphony in A Major. I'd like to go through this work exploring how the music is put together. Um, I do believe that if, you are, if you're able to follow the structure in a classical musical movement, it can greatly aid your appreciation and enjoyment of it. That's why I do these videos. Now, Bruckner started this um, in the summer of 1879. And uh, it took him two years to complete it. Um, he was interrupted by uh, revisions to the Fourth Symphony, uh, his string quintet, uh, amongst other things. When he finished it, he dedicated it to his landlord, Dr. Anton von Erdset Nevin, and his wife Amy. It wasn't performed in its entirety until Mahler conducted it with the Vienna Philharmonic uh, on the 26th of February 1899. Uh, but that was a kind of a bastardised version, really. The, the actual uh, symphony, as uh, Bruckner uh, would have intended it to be, uh, was, wasn't performed until uh, the 14th of March 1901, conducted by Karl Polig in Stuttgart. The Sixth Symphony isn't as well known as some of the other Bruckner symphonies, particularly the likes of the Seventh, Eighth or Ninth. But... Um, it really is a fantastic symphony. It's certainly shorter than many of Bruckner's symphonies for a start, uh, but it's got some great themes and some really powerful moments and some slight differences to what Bruckner normally does in the symphony, which we'll have a look at as we go through. Now, the first movement is in clear sonata form, and as usual with Bruckner, there are three subject groups. Um, and we begin with this, uh, this unforgettable rhythm in the violins. Kind of a uh, hammering away there, almost like the, uh, the anvils in Das Rheingold. Uh, very quiet though, has to be said. Um, this kind of nervous rhythm uh, is, uh, for Bruckner, a different way to open a symphony. Usually with Bruckner you have like the tremolo, don't you? Something like that or whatever. But with this we got that. And then underneath we have this uh, this kind of lumbering melody in the basses, which um, Sir Donald Tovey in his uh, analysis of this describes as a leviathan. I love that description. Expect with Bruckner, there's these kind of subsidiary ideas uh, going around, uh, often in the woodwinds. Da, 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 da. Before we have this fortissimo statement, as is often with Bruckner as well. Um, really great stuff. Then we get to the, uh, the second subject group, um, the more song-like uh, part of the exposition. Um, and we move into E minor to begin with here, uh, with this impassioned theme. Thing. Listen, you listen out for those turns. Uh, I think quite characteristic of Bruckner uh, to include those in these, these melodic lines. 
and also the passing notes in the second violins. Um, this kind of uh, second subject group really is in a mini ternary form by itself. We have this in the middle, this new chorale like idea on the, uh, the woodwinds and horns. <laughs> we go back to a more impassioned statement of uh, the main second subject idea. There's this kind of juxtaposition between um, kind of a triplet motion da, 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 in the basses. With a more straightforward four square kind of rhythm over the top. There's this kind of rhythmic tension throughout this music. We then come into the third subject group. Then it goes up a key. The music uh, blazes away and eventually it uh, dies down. We reach a kind of codetta section, um, which eventually settles down into E major, which is where we've been aiming for all along, from the A, a major at the beginning. But we end with this uh, rhythmic idea, the end of the codetta, which is carried over into the development. We hear this. Then we hear um, the, that kind of opening theme from the first subject, the Leviathan theme. Remember it when um, Da, 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 da. Well, this time it's going. Um, da, 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 da. So it's kind of uh, just turned upside down. Um, it's an inversion. Now, the development is actually rather short compared to other first movements in Bruckner symphonies, we eventually come back to a crashing restatement of the first subject theme, of the Leviathan theme. And, um, but it's in the wrong key. But I, I, I think this is the beginning of the recapitulation nonetheless. Um, we're in E flat major, rather remote from the home key, A major of course. Glorious, isn't it? And then eventually the theme is restated in A major. Uh, we have the second subject group, um, this time beginning in F sharp minor, um, before we have the, the third subject group again as well. And then we come to uh, you know, a really wonderful coda, um, kind of Wagnerian in its scope. But I love the horn in this coda, really beautiful. chords there. I just love those 
chord changes, aren't they beautiful? Uh, the way they just kind of slide uh, up a semitone. It adds a kind of whole new dimension to the musical experience. It's these kind of heavenly glimpses. And then uh, the movement ends with, uh, at the end of the coda, with a dramatic restatement of that main Leviathan theme. The Adagio, the second movement, is a solemn and serious piece, very beautiful in places too, um, which unusually for a Bruckner slow movement is in sonata form, um, with three subjects, like the first movement. Uh, we begin with this idea, with this descending bass. Above that, uh, when it's repeated, we have this, this beautiful oboe line, very fragile, anguished, almost like something from Bach cantata or something. Something like that anyway. Then after this, we have a new idea, which has got something of passionate yearning about it. This is the second subject. And, um, and it comes back with such passion in the recapitulation. Um, we then come to a third subject, which is this kind of funeral march in C minor. We then have a development which um, dwells much on that first subject idea, uh, which, we, which we first hear on the horns. With the recapitulation, each of the, the first subject and the second subject are kind of, uh, they have these kind of glorious transformations. Um, Bruckner, of course, was very, was very religious, um, a devout Catholic, so something i think of the music when it returns is being animated by the holy spirit perhaps And then we have um, the third subject again, uh, which is which is altered um, near the end to uh, dovetail into a touching coda. Uh, this really is a very beautiful and uh, and spiritual piece of music. The third movement, the scherzo, is um, as you'd expect, um, full of rasping horns. 
a bit like the Scherzo for the Fourth Symphony, for instance. Um, but it's got some quirky bits, particularly in the trio, which is quite different from other uh, Bruckner symphonies. Uh, we begin with this uh, repeated pedal note. Uh, we're in um, A minor here. kind of thing. Um, and as usual with Bruckner and many other symphonists, the A section, the scherzo itself, can be divided into uh, a small ternary form itself. And um, with the second, uh, the middle part, in the actual scherzo being something of a development. By the time we get to the end of the scherzo section, we have these thrilling, rasping horn fanfares. Um, Really exciting stuff. The trio is very different um, from what we normally have. We normally have something akin to a Lendler in a Bruckner um, trio um, dance movement. Um, here we're not in three, but we're in four, four eight, and uh, the tempo's slower. Um, so it's got a completely different feel. <laughs> Such an interesting uh, trio, this one. Uh, uh, really memorable. Um, quite quirky, I think. And then, of course, we have the return to the scherzo. The finale is in uh, sonata form, again, with three subjects. And uh, we begin with that tremolo, uh, which we normally hear right at the beginning of a uh, Bruckner symphony. But here we, we just hear it in the finale. And we have this um, rather mournful, lugubrious sounding tune. Based on the Phrygian mode, actually, that F, which resolves onto the E, uh, Phrygian mode. And also in this first subject group, listen out for this uh, rhythm, da da, da da, da da, that kind of permeates this movement. Um, particularly, um, we hear it cutting through in the brass. You also hear this idea. Kind of a, an early climax in this movement. We then have this thrilling unison passage. Great stuff. We then come to this wonderfully romantic second subject, real outpouring of passion. This is split between the first and second violins. And then we have a third subject, which uh, is typically Brucknerian, kind of a monothematic statement throughout um, much of the orchestra. The development begins with a um, kind of plodding pedal note, this time an F, which 
which kind of recalls the opening of the skirt so and we have the short rhythmic ideas we've just heard in the third subject and to a lesser extent in the first subjects as well that that rhythm da -dum, da -da -da, is the mainstay of this development section we hear more of the first subject in this development section as well and eventually Sure enough, we come to the recapitulation where the first subject is heard in its truncated form, beginning with that kind of violin etude uh, idea. Back in A major, we hear the second subject again, as you'd expect. The third subject, um, dwelling on that. Da, 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 rhythm and then we finally come to the coda and uh, the coda is marvellous because in typical Brucknerian uh, fashion we return to, to that stirring melody uh, from the first subject of the first movement which really uh, brings us back full circle and gives uh, an enormous unity to this, um, this wonderful symphony. Here we go. Ready? You've got to hand it to Bruckner, his codas are marvellous. So that's the Sixth Symphony by Bruckner and um, if this is your kind of thing please click like and subscribe. Uh, please put down any pieces you'd like me to look at in the future. I've got a, quite a long list so I'm trying to work my way through it and uh, thanks for watching. Bye.